So um, yes, so clinical brain imaging is, uh, is essentially um, a domain uh, of uh, radiology that has developed um, tremendously over the past uh, decades. Um, and the beauty of it, it's um, like in most aspects of uh, biomedical imaging, is that it uh, resorts to uh, you know, fundamental principles of physics. Uh, and people often ask what are fundamental science uh, topics uh, good for and developments good for. And sometimes it's just for the beauty of science. But um, medical imaging uh, is definitely one beautiful example where there's a, a fundamental or a very strong translational aspect from basic science to uh, things that are truly useful uh, in, everyday, in everyday life or in people's lives, especially for clinical uh, and therapeutic aspects. So um, if you look at all the available techniques uh, today, uh, for brain imaging in particular, um, again, they are all based on these fundamental principles of, of physics um, related to uh, nuclear um, or atomic energy, atomic uh, uh, physics. Uh, but also X-rays, um, electromagnetics, this kind of aspects. So in a nutshell, um, there might be a, a handful of techniques that are present in most uh, you know, um, hospitals, uh, starting with the, uh, uh, the principles of X-ray propagation uh, and transmission through different tissues uh, of the body and of the head in particular, through the, through the brain and through the skull. So the most popular by far is certainly CT scanning. And CT stands for computerized tomography, where basically x-rays are uh, sent by a source through the, through the brain and through the head. And the attenuation and scattering of the x-rays is uh, analyzed with um, a computer, hence uh, you know, the CT acronym for, for the technique. And, uh, the, the principle is actually, um, again, relatively simple, and the outcome of the, uh, uh, the test is um, uh, to basically localize and assess whether someone has suffered from a traumatic brain injury, maybe a stroke. Uh, and so the technique is very good at looking and localizing and um, identifying you know, major uh, insults to the brain. Uh, but with a relatively poor specificity in terms of where anatomically um, the, um, the, the lesion, for instance, is located with respect to what structure. It's relatively easy, of course, and straightforward to you know, identify whether it's more on the right side or the left side, obviously, uh, of the brain, whether it's more frontal or posterior. But with respect to the you know, very fine anatomy of the brain, the convolutions, the folds, etc., uh, it's not as good as uh, the most recent techniques. But relatively speaking, uh, it's still very popular for two reasons. The cost is relatively reasonable, so to speak. Uh, and also, very importantly for hospitals, the, um, the, the duration of the, uh, of the test is uh, relatively short, usually a few minutes for a whole brain um, evaluation, if you will. And that's very important, obviously, in a situation of emergency uh, to the patient, but also for you know, the high throughput of uh, you know, um, testing uh, a high volume of patients uh, in a radiology department. So still today, for um, you know, clinical purposes, CT scans are the, by far the most used uh, uh, tests in, in the radiology and neuroradiology department. For research, though, it's not, except the very research based on the development of the instrumentation to the next, uh, you know, frontier, uh, and maybe some aspects of data analysis and image, uh, image analysis, this is not so much um, a tool for research in neuroscience, for instance, but uh, uh, we are talking here about clinical imaging. So what has uh, taken over not so much the, um, in terms of volume, but in terms of specific uh, questions that the medical doctors can ask about their patients. Uh, so what has taken over um, over the past 15 years or 20 years now is um, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. And uh, again, it's beautiful physics uh, in action. Um, it's based on multiple principles of atomic um, uh, resonance of particles. 
uh, when they interact uh, with a magnetic field. So we can explain that a bit later. But uh, basically the idea is to uh, use these principles of physics to reveal many different things in the brain. So um, in a clinical setting, uh, what uh, MRI is used for is essentially to reveal very fine details about uh, possible um, um, issues that uh, affect uh, the patient's brain. So like I said before, for CT scan, in terms of um, the anatomical localization of a brain tumor, of a brain lesion, or you know, bleeding in terms of, of stroke, uh, ischemic stroke also uh, with respect to you know, uh, a reduction of the perfusion uh, of the brain tissues uh, with, the, with blood supply. These are very important questions that a medical doctor needs to basically uh, answer to, to properly evaluate a patient in different situations. And the beauty of MRI is really to be able to offer like a catalog of things you can um, basically uh, access to using always the same instrument, that MRI scanner. And um, the spatial resolution and the specificity of what you're looking at is way higher than uh, with uh, CT scanning at the expense of both a more uh, uh, costly instrument, uh, but also um, maybe of uh, a duration of the tests that uh, may range from a few minutes to sometimes uh, tens of minutes, depending on uh, how deep you want to, to go in terms of spatial resolution. And in uh, today's uh, basically uh, equipment uh, in MRI units, we are talking about a maximum spatial resolution in a clinical setting of about a few millimeters uh, cube. Uh, of brain tissues, which when you think about it is, is quite a tour de force, because again, we are not opening the skull of people anymore, uh, for, uh, at, except at rare, with rare, uh, rare exceptions, um, to basically evaluate uh, their, their clinical status. So in that, in that respect, the, the clinical imaging techniques that have developed over the, the past few decades have really revolutionized uh, the way um, you know, the assessment of brain uh, conditions is being done in, in the hospital. You know, over the, the, the past uh, centuries, so to speak, and again, even until recently, it was not possible at all to assess, you know, what was affecting somebody's mind or somebody's uh, uh, brain and behavior without, uh, you know, proceeding to biopsies or opening the skulls and looking at what was happening in there with all the risks and traumatisms that are uh, going together with this kind of operation. So it's, uh, it's definitely uh, a revolution that has taken place and that is well in March in, uh, in most, uh, you know, hospitals. I need to mention a third uh, technique that is also very much used. It's based on nuclear... Uh, it's basically uh, at the interface between nuclear medicine and uh, neuroradiology. And it's all the techniques that revolve around um, the uh, emission and, uh, and uh, scattering of radioisotopes that are injected in very small quantities in the bloodstream. And we are talking about two, essentially two techniques. Uh, one is called uh, SPECT, that's the English acronym, and it stands for Single Photon Emission Computer Tomography. And the second one is PET, it's positron uh, emission tomography. So the two, in very lay terms, are very related, um, with PET being more specific in terms of what brain systems or um, uh, alterations of those systems by, again, a disease or even a mental condition um, so it's more specific with PET and you can achieve better accuracy and specificity again uh, in terms of biology and metabolism uh, than with uh, SPECT. And definitely it's, it's, um, it's like MRI with respect to CT, if you will. SPECT would be the equivalent of CT uh, for anatomy and uh, PET would be more equivalent to, to MRI. And just like MRI, PET is, is very much a technique that is used um, a lot in research. So in, in that respect, too, too uh, it's definitely a, a technique that has been developing um, in the recent years a lot to target and assess you know, specific pharmacological, 
biopharmacological systems in the brain. So, for instance, you can map the uh, intake and production of dopamine um, in, in the brain using, using PET, but, um, which is very important in some uh, disorders, including uh, in psychiatric and mental disorders. Um, you can also look at inflammation, which is a process that is very much at play in many different aspects of uh, uh, brain, uh, brain diseases and syndromes. And um, you can also look at um, very specific uh, aspects of uh, uh, accumulation of mis misfolded proteins uh, in the brain, and which, uh, like in the case of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disease, diseases, is um, is very key to assess again uh, the uh, the condition of a of a patient, and uh, this has uh, revolutionized uh, the way uh, you know uh, we uh, screen patients for uh, not only establish a proper diagnostic that is, that would be as specific as uh, as possible, but also to evaluate the efficacy of uh, present and future treatments um, in clinical trials. So that's also very important. And in that respect, these are important techniques that play key roles to bridge, uh, you know, basic research, uh, including cl clinical research with the, um, the clinical routine. And, uh, and this is very important uh, indeed also for the patients and not only for the doctors. What important aspect indeed when we talk about, you know, this translation between research, biomedical research in imaging and the clinical reality and if we put aside very important aspects of, uh, you know, cost to hospitals and to societies, where basically access, for instance, to MRI is, 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 uh, is a great concern in, uh, in many countries um, because of the cost of the equipment and, and of the qualified personnel also. Um, if we go back to the, you know, these, uh, these aspects of research, for instance, what is very um, exciting these days in, uh, in MRI research is uh, looking at brain functions or um, also the way the, the brain is wired. So I've talked a little bit about the, you know, the great diversity of things we can see with MRI. And, and, uh, but in the clinical uh, setting, we, you know, where procedures need to be very efficient, very as, as quick as possible, and also reproducible um, uh, uh, with a great variety of patients, which means also the, the, the test must, must be as short as possible. Uh, so there are constraints in the clinical realm that we don't have in research. But for instance, in, in functional brain imaging with uh, MRI, we are looking at uh, you know, very tiny um, variations of uh, metabolism that is related to brain function. So it relates to, for instance, the consumption of oxygen by um, uh, the metabolisms of uh, neuronal activity. And you know, these things have been uh, uh, you know, very much publicized and published in research over the past 20 plus years. It's just amazing how this has, uh, you know, produced a, a tremendous uh, progress in uh, on our understanding of uh, uh, brain functions. Yet in the clinical, um, I should say in the clinic, there is no test that is uh, taking advantage of these developments. So we are talking about millions of dollars in research, in fundamental research and, and cognitive neuroscience and even psychology that hasn't translated to the clinic. And one of the reasons is that most of this, um, uh, of, of this research require the testing of uh, you know, relatively large cohorts of patients or um, uh, participants because, the, uh, again, the, the level of signal is very weak with respect to... Um, you know, the, the level of noise in the scanner. And therefore, you need to look at, uh, you know, effects that are revealed usually on a group of people. And it's very hard to detect, you know, uh, uh, signals that are related to brain function in a single individual with a good level of certainty. Um, and that's why in a clinical test, you actually want that level of certainty so that you can derive a conclusion with respect to the condition of that patient you're looking at and uh, so this is really a bottleneck uh, in the translation from, again, huge research efforts that are, I think, very positive and very um, significant, 
uh, and that has produced new knowledge and the relatively poor um, you know, application of the technique in the clinical setting because, again, of lack of uh, sensitivity of the technique at the individual level. You want to pose a diagnostic with certainty on an individual, but yet the sensitivity of the technique is not quite there yet. So uh, there is hope uh, to see that uh, you know, kind of um, resolved in the, in the not so distant future. And through two, essentially two, um, two aspects. The first one is always the race to uh, you know, develop and produce scanners that have higher sensitivity. So in that respect, um, for instance, MRI is racing towards using stronger and stronger magnetic fields so that the sensitivity and the level of noise is uh, reduced and so that hopefully we can have better images of brain structure and function in a single individual and um, essentially function because structure is, is for sure already resolved uh, at the individual level. So we'll see how it goes, but this is definitely the next challenge for for, for uh, functional MRI in the clinical setting.